Dear colleagues, welcome to everyone in the audience. My name is Sarah Bakuri. I am an agriculture officer at uh, the Secretariat of the Rotterdam Convention, and uh, it is my pleasure to moderate this webinar on integrated pest management theory and practice. Before we start, let me briefly uh, remind you of a few housekeeping rules. The whole webinar will be held in English. During the webinar, if you have specific questions for any of our panelists, please write them in the Q&A box and not on the chat box. And it would be kind of you to mention to whom you are addressing your question. The webinar is recorded, and if you would like to watch it again, you can review it from the webinar library of the Rotterdam Convention website, peak.int, where you will find as well copies of all the presentations. For any IT support, you can contact our colleague Javier Bonilla, and his email uh, is uh, here on uh, the screen, javier.bonia at uh, fao.org. Uh, today, we will take a closer look uh, into one of the most important subjects related uh, to the plant protection and the production, which is the integrated pest management, mostly known as IPM, increasingly adopted as one of the main long-term solutions to ensure sustainable crop production. My colleague Mario Yarto, Agricultural Officer at the Secretariat of the Rotterdam Convention, will give the opening remarks. Then Mr. Luciano Rovesti, crop protection specialist, will give us an overview on the IPM. After that, Dr. Hadi Bouyong, agriculture officer and coordinator of the Global Action for Fall Armyworm Control at FAO, will explain how to not to waste a crisis by giving a concrete example on fall armyworm uh, invasion as an opportunity to develop and scale up IPM interventions. And uh, with uh, Mr. Elijah Getiro from uh, Flamingo Horticulture, a company based in uh, Kenya, we will learn practical IPM in commercial horticulture. After these presentations, we will have the discussion session and the closing remarks will be given by the Secretariat of the Rotterdam Convention. And now it's my great pleasure to hand over the microphone to Mr. Mario Yarto, who will inaugurate our webinar today. Mario, please, the floor are yours. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We are not hearing you, Mario. Yes, Mario, okay. I hear you, I hear you. Can you hear you too, Mario? Thanks. Uh, again, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I hope uh, you are all well, whatever you are. Thank you for joining us today. I am also pleased to share with you that we have participants coming from all over the world. So we are happy that even though there is uh, an important time difference for some of you, um, you didn't care about uh, having an early morning or a late night to join. Uh, this webinar. On behalf of the Secretariat of the Rotterdam Convention, I am very pleased to welcome you to this uh, online event. Uh, I am an agricultural officer with the Rotterdam Convention Secretariat in the Plant Production and Protection Division at FAO. Today's webinar on integrated pest management theory and practice is organized by the Rotterdam Convention Secretariat under the Technical Assistance Program of the Convention. This session is part of a series of webinars that aim to underscore the importance of promoting sound pesticide management, as well as the identification and use of alternatives to reduce risks to human health and the environment. The objective of today's event is to provide an overview of integrated pest management, also known as IPM, and of the basic principles it is based upon, many of which represent good agricultural practices and therefore by themselves are needed to grow a healthy crop independent of the presence of pests and diseases. Before starting with our program, I also take the opportunity to thank and warmly welcome today's speakers, Luciano Rovesti, Buyung Hadi, and Elijah Getiro, who kindly accepted to participate in this event and share their knowledge and experience in a subject that I am sure is of interest to all of us. I am confident that you will find the presentations informative and most of all, very instructive. 
After the presentations, you will have the opportunity to interact with our panelists during the Q&A session. Again, thank you very much for your kind attention. And now I would like to give again the floor to my colleague, Sarah, who will moderate the webinar. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mario, for this uh, interesting uh, introduction. Uh, Luciano, uh, please uh, take the floor. Right. Uh, just a second. Can, can you see my screen properly? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, Luciano. Well, thank you, Sarah, for for your introduction, and uh, well, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today to talk about a subject that I'm very keen on, which is integrated pest management. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion on IPM over the last several years, but I have the impression that still we are not all on the same uh, wavelength when it comes to defining what IPM is. And that's why I would like to give this brief overview of IPM and of the technical solutions that it can employ. Obviously, due to time limitations, it will not be possible to discuss things in detail, but uh, hopefully we can clarify doubts on any specific aspect during the question and answer session. Now, what is IPM? Uh, th there are several definitions of it. Uh, this is the official definition given by FAO. And I would like to draw your attention on the two uh, key ideas, on the two core ideas contained in this definition. So IPM is about integration of all available pest control techniques. And it is also about minimizing risk to human health and the environment. Or in other words, IPM is not only interested in controlling pests, it's also interested in uh, safeguarding human health and the environment. Uh, let's see some basic concept. Normally when we talk about, when we use the word pest, we normally think of an animal organism that can be an insect, it can be a vertebrate. But in IPM, when we talk about pest, we normally include uh, any organism capable of causing economic damage. Uh, therefore, th this term includes fungi, bacteria, insects, weeds, and so on. Uh, I think it is important to mention that uh, uh, normally many of, of, of the principles guiding IPM are not rocket science. Very often they uh, represent simply represent good agricultural practices and therefore by themselves are needed to grow a healthy crop whether there is presence of a pest or not also is important to remember that ipm relies on local experience which means that it is not a magic recipe that can be applied in the same way under all conditions uh, rather it may or better it should be customized to suit the specific conditions of the environment where it is being implemented. And if we look at it uh, in a didactical way, we can say that an IPM program is made up by five components, which I have written down in this slide. Today we will briefly touch only three of them, which are prevention, monitoring and control. So why do we need IPM? Uh, the answer to this question, I think can simply be because there is an urgent need to improve the way in which we do crop protection. And 
I will try and illustrate such a need by mentioning some of the issues that people like myself who often work in the field frequently come across. So the first of these issues is that there is clearly an over-reliance on chemical pesticides uh, by farmers who very often have limited knowledge about, uh, li little knowledge about alternative methods for pest management. Uh, another issue is that um, despite the fact that some farmers apply pesticides often, particularly those working for producing, for example, vegetables, uh, sometimes they fail uh, to control the pest, even with an intensive use of pesticides. That can be due to a number of reasons. It can be resistance of the pest to the pesticide. It can be a poor application of the pesticide by the farmer. So it, there, there may be different reasons, but it is a problem that one can often one can observe. Then uh, farmers often use highly toxic pesticides and at the same time they make little use or no use at all of personal and protective equipment. Why do farmers use highly toxic pesticides? Uh, sometimes it's because of lack of knowledge, sometimes because that's what they can afford. And sometimes it's because the market offer an inadequate choice of pesticides. So just to give you an example of that, uh, this is the result of a survey that I conducted in a country where I have been, where I worked recently and refers to insecticides. So we found on the market 33 commercial products but when one analyzed down to active ingredients level, could realize that there were only uh, 13 active ingredients and many of them would share uh, the same mode of action. So it, it is quite clear, we, we don't have time to analyze this any further, but it is clear that with this kind of pesticide offer, with more than 80% of the products belonging to organophosphates, carbamates, or pyrethroids groups, it is difficult to implement a sound program for crop protection. Another issue uh, which can be normally frequently observed is that many farmers uh, simply ignore the label, they don't read the label, or in some countries, very often the pesticides come with a label that is in a language uh, that the farmer cannot understand. And this means that they miss important information that must be included in the label. Uh, there is also a general tendency to overdose pesticides. Uh, in this, from these pictures, you can see how many farmers will dose the pesticides uh, in the field, in, the, in their practice. And it is easy to understand how they can get the dose wrong. It can be less than needed or more than needed, although normally they apply more than needed. Uh, another issue is uh, an improper or wrong identification of the problem. A practical example, this symptom on tomatoes is uh, due to calcium deficiency, but many farmers will start spraying it uh, with pesticides, with fungicides, thinking that it is a disease. And obviously, since it's a physiological disorder, applying a fungicide simply means wasting time and money. Another common issue is that most farmers, but unfortunately also many extension agents, are not familiar with the notion of the active ingredient of a pesticide. So this is a practical example from a tomato grower who was desperate trying to uh, control tooth absoluta on his crops. And for that reason, he would 
do big mixtures of different pesticides, including four different insecticides, at least what he thought were four different insecticides. But if you look at the labels, it is quite clear that this, the, the, the labels are different, the commercial names are different, but this one is the same as this one, and this one is the same as this one. So clearly it makes no sense having a mix of that kind. And one final issue is the management or the disposal of pesticide containers. Apart from that, as you can see, is done in a very bad way. And this, apart from bringing about environmental contamination, also poses other risks because in countries which are resource poor, many people will try to reuse these plastic containers to store other liquids, sometimes even drinking water. Now, said this, let's go back to IPM and uh, uh, let's see briefly the diff different components. Prevention, what, what is prevention? Prevention is adopting all practices that prevent a pest from infesting a crop or limit their development. And you can see a range of different options here. Uh, let's see some practical examples. Crop rotation is a well-known agronomical technique uh, that is very useful and very effective in managing soil-borne pests. Uh, we can use physical barriers. Uh, here you can see an ice crop and a tunnel and uh, these side vents which are open. And uh, we all know the importance when we work under greenhouse or under tunnel to ventilate, to manage temperature and humidity. But if we leave it completely open like this, pests can go and come as they please. So we should have something like a mesh closing the side vents to stop or to make it difficult for the pest to uh, to infest the, the crop. Uh, something as simple as the mesh can be a good solution even in the open field. This is an example from Eritrea where tomato growers were struggling to get their seedlings uh, to the transplanting phase uh, because of tuta absoluta. And by simply using this protection over uh, their uh, nurseries, uh, were, were, successful, su were successful in solving that problem. Field sanitation is also very important. This is quite a common view. This used to be a cabbage crop. Uh, the next cabbage crop was planted just a few meters aside. But if one took uh, one of those leaves, this is what could be observed as many as 20 pupae or larvae of the diamond back moth. And this is, is only about one third of one leaf. So this gives you an idea that if you leave uh, crop residues uh, or in the field like that, it is a focus of infestation for, for your new crops. And it will force you to apply continuously pesticides on the new crop. Water management is also very important. So you should pay attention to the amount of water that you apply, because if you exceed with it, with water running everywhere, you will end up like this. So the, the, the one in the, on the right hand side is just the same crop as this one after three weeks because of poor water management most of the plants were going down with fusarium. And also very important as a preventive measure is to maintain a, a healthy soil. A fertile, healthy soil means a healthy plant, a healthy crop. There are different ways to maintain a fertile, healthy soil. I have mentioned a few here. But I think the most important one is to maintain a high content of organic matter. Now, moving on to the second component uh, that we are going to touch today, monitoring. Uh, very often, 
farmers realize that they have a problem on their crops when the problem is already big. Uh, there is a need for, uh, for farmers or for their assessors to go to the field often and check the identity and the quantity of pests, but also the identity and quantity of beneficence and to keep records of what they observe, something that very few people do. Now, this assessment can be done visually or in some cases, we can also aid ourselves through the use of traps, like these sticky traps that are very useful uh, to monitor flying insects, or we can use more specific traps that make use of pheromones like these ones. And traps are normally used only for monitoring purposes. Or sometimes uh, it can, they can also be useful tools for control. Like in this case, uh, I work with some colleagues from Equatorial Guinea. They have a, a big problem with this, uh, with this fruit fly. And we found that using uh, the simple homemade traps, we could reduce quite a lot the number of those flies on the crops. Finally, uh, if we talk about control, if from our observations, we come to the conclusion that we must implement some control measures, then we must choose the method and we have uh, quite a wide, quite a broad range of methods. We must choose the methods that optimize cost and effect while at the same time minimizing the negative effects. Uh, we have different types of control, as we said, that can go from cultural control to the use of chemical pesticides. But let's see some practical examples. If we talk about cultural controls, intercropping is generally uh, effective as long as one chooses the right combination of crops. What you see in this picture is a special kind of intercropping that was developed by ISIPE in Kenya for the control of fall armyworm, but I'm not going uh, to say much about this because you will certainly hear more details about it from the next speaker. Then mechanical and physical means, for example, through the use of plastic films, we can apply a technique which is known as solarization uh, to control, uh, to manage a pest, a soil borne pests, or through, plastic, through the use of plastic mulching, we can control weeds. Uh, it's a very effective method. I think we should do it with care because in the areas where it is used very intensively. The residues of plastic is, is becoming a problem. And then another physical method is the use of steam. Uh, some years ago, various companies developed uh, machines for, the steril for sterilizing the soil, uh, which from a te which technically uh, they do the work, uh, they are effective, but in my opinion, there are downsides with the use of this method. It may be useful for specific applications, but I will not recommend it for general use. Uh, we need, in my opinion, we need to increase soil biodiversity rather than decreasing it. Then we can use beneficial insects and mice in several countries. Now there are companies producing beneficials that farmers can buy and apply on their crops. And here you can see what is probably uh, the most successful example of a beneficial predator uh, from a commercial point of view, which is the predatory mite Phytocellulus persimilis. And then we can use also biological pesticides, which are pesticides insecticides, no, which are pesticides based on microorganisms, it can be bacteria, can be fungi, or can be viruses. And these are normally produced either by fermentation or on a solid substrate.
uh, biopesticides can also be based on uh, plant extract and neem that you can see figured here uh, is probably one of the best known examples. Another Luciano, please, one minute left. One minute, okay. Uh, another powerful tool is uh, the use of uh, resistant, uh, resistant uh, varieties. And we should not forget to mention also chemical pesticides. Chemical pesticides, the use of chemical pesticides should always be our last option, but they still represent an important tool for crop protection. Unfortunately, as we have seen, they're often used in an inappropriate way. Now, if we want to summarize the benefits of IPM, we can say that IPM uh, minimizes health risks and protects the environment because it allows us to uh, reduce the number of treatments. It can or should be adapted to local circumstances and provides long-term solutions. There are some disadvantages and amongst the disadvantages, we can mention the fact that it requires a higher degree of knowledge and management capability. It also requires a higher degree of commitment and it is more labor intensive than chemical pesticides. To conclude, I would say that moving from a chemically based approach to IPM is an often long but necessary process if we want our crop protection practices to be truly effective and safe. It is a process certainly not free from difficulties, especially for those countries where only a limited number of the technical tools that we have mentioned are easily available. Nevertheless, I feel that it's still an objective within our reach. And in my opinion, whenever we face difficulties, we should always guide ourselves by following a saying that I like very much, and that goes like this. Those who are willing to do, find solutions. Those who are not, find excuses. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Luciano, for uh, this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Hadi Bouyong, now uh, you have uh, the floor. All right, well, thank you, uh, Luciano, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, uh, please. Uh, to... Yeah, is this... thank you, perfect. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for Rotterdam Convention for inviting me to be one of the speakers uh, this uh, this afternoon, um, well, morning, good afternoon, good evening, even uh, to all the participants. I see some familiar names. Very, very good to see you all again. I see Sachi, uh, Munyapan Ramaswamy, uh, Juliana Jaramillo, colleagues uh, <clears throat> from Burkina Faso, from Tanzania, um, well, th thank you, thank you for, for, for being here. I uh, look forward for our discussion on this. So my job here is to sort of flesh out what, what uh, Luciano has already described uh, and sort of bring it into, how does it look like in, in um, uh, maize, uh, especially in terms of managing a lot more. Uh, two things that I wanna start with. The first one is the, the title, uh, how not to waste a crisis. Um, uh, I hope it will become clear through my presentation that I really think that uh, Palamurum invasion uh, outside its native range uh, constitutes a crisis. Uh, but then it's a crisis that we can sort of, through which we can, we can sort of uh, uh, glean some sort of uh, opportunity uh, to develop and scale up interventions. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of the data, I mean, this, this, this presentation is really not just my own. A lot of the data that I'm going to present here come from our technical committee members. Uh, I'll, I'll, I will try to explain uh, the shape of the, uh, the FAO Global Action uh, to, to explain who are the technical committee members. All right, so as I mentioned, the, the, the following worm is, is uh, native in, in the Americas. Uh, they were first found or reported outside the Americas in, in, the, in 2016, six countries in Africa then. And since then, as you can see in the map and also in the graph there, uh, up to now there's 77 countries uh, reporting uh, 
uh, test. <laughs> and if you see the map, it's, you know, most of the countries in the, in the tropic uh, where it has not established itself has, has now reported um, the presence of alarm worms. So, so if you see this tapering, it's because it's, it's running out of countries to, to invade really. And a couple of weeks ago, it was last reported in the Solomon Islands. Uh, and we are now busy trying to ramp up our, our response, not only in the Solomon Islands, but also surrounding countries in the Pacific to, to prepare for, for the uh, introduction of the uh, um, why Why is this pest important? First of all, of course, the year loss. There are so many different estimates out there about you know what kind of field loss are we really seeing uh, at field level associated with fallout worm. These are just compilations of numbers from different uh, uh, publications, as well as FAO's own uh, work in Tanzania uh, that show that it range anywhere between 11 to about 22% of, of, of field loss at the field level. Um, Kabi came up with an estimate of about $9.8 billion uh, worth of yield loss annually in Africa. Um, and that, that if we take this range, that, that about gel that, um, that, that number. But on the other side, um, on one side, it's, it's, it's a threat uh, towards food security because of, the, because of the yield loss. On the other side, the way uh, we have been responding to, to alarm worm uh, may present its own uh, uh, problem. So again, compilations of different uh, publications out there show that there is now sort of an uptick um, in different countries of, of the use of conventional pesticide to manage for alarm worm on maize, anywhere between 30, 36, 37% to an upward of 80% in, in some countries. Uh, also in Asia, for example, there's a paper that came out of China that showed that for alarm worm uh, or the introduction of alarm worm coincided with the tripling of, of uh, pesticide purchase costs uh, among, among farmers in at least, at least one province in, in China. Okay, so now let's drill down into, into uh, what kind of pesticides are being used. Uh, this is again work from Kabi that showed that some of the pesticides being used are actually highly hazardous pesticides. And this is, of course, a uh, uh, reason to be, to be concerned. Uh, most of the pesticides uh, used are moderately hazardous, uh, and, and then only, only very little are, are in a uh, slightly uh, less hazardous uh, class. This, together with the fact that in, in many, many countries, um, risk reduction practices, you know, use of PPEs are not necessarily the norm. What you see here is the percentage of households not using anything uh, to protect themselves when they apply pesticides versus different types of, of PPEs that are being used. And what you can see there is, that, you know, anywhere between 25 to an up about 50% is probably not, not using anything um, that, that perhaps contribute to the uh, percentage of households reporting at least one pesticide related health symptom. This, uh, the, the, the whole story um, sort of indicate that alarm worm is a threat on multiple fronts, uh, not only in terms of yield loss, uh, perhaps also farmers' livelihood, 9.8 billion US dollars. Uh, but also in terms of human health uh, and most probably environmental health. So multiple partners have worked separately since 2016 to respond to this uh, biological invasion, if you will, uh, including FAO. So FAO had its own uh, efforts. And then in 2019, FAO decided to uh, provide an umbrella, uh, a platform, if you will, uh, to try to coordinate uh, the movements, the, the, the efforts of all of these different partners. Uh, of course, the partners will, will you know, they, they, they have their own specialties, they have their own uh, work and they have their own initiatives. 
and 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 our partnership is really more of a loose coordination partnership at the global, regional, uh, and and national level, trying to uh, trying to lockstep everybody so that so that we are we are we are moving towards uh, generally the same direction. Uh, the global action has uh, these three stated objectives: reducing crop yield loss to about five to ten percent. You remember the other numbers uh, that goes up to twenty-two. Um, limiting further spread by applying uh, representative measures, or at the very least, preparing countries uh, for introductions that may may happen in, in year two or three, especially countries in areas where farmers can actually establish themselves, and of course, conducting global coordination to achieve the first two objectives. I'll go very quick through this. So the Global Action has a steering committee that is led by our Director General. It is it has a, a technical committee in which a lot of the research partners uh, from from whom I got the data that I'm presenting in this uh, in this webinar uh, are part of you know organizations such as CG, which is the CIMIT, ICAF, uh, but then also CABI, ECP, universities. Uh, national, regional, uh, as well as, as, as uh, 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 national uh, research uh, institutions are, are parts of, of our technical committee. We have a secretariat that I coordinate based in FAO. Uh, and we also have a working group for resource mobilization. Such, such a big effort would require uh, quite, quite, quite a gargantuan uh, uh, resource mobilization effort. Uh, we have national task forces uh, in eight demonstration countries. And then we, we split the world into eight zones, if you will. Each zone will have one demonstration country and, and the surrounding countries are what we call scale up or pilot countries. So a lot of the activities are concentrated in the demonstration countries. And, and there's, there's a lot of extension effort trying to share information uh, to, to the countries surrounding the demonstration countries. Okay, so let's let's go into the IPM side of what what we are doing. Um, Luciano took a, a, a broader view of of what constitutes an IPM, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm going now into the control part, and 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 he already mentioned some of this, but but one illustration that I found particularly useful uh, is is the, the the classic IPM pyramid. Why I find it useful because you see here a lot of the practices that happen in the uh, on the on the bottom of, of the pyramids uh, contribute to what I think as increasing the resiliency of the ecosystem against against the past. So, and we'll talk about that one by one. And then of course the sampling. And only at top we use insecticides, especially chemical uh, insecticides, uh, as needed. Again, why do I like the, the pyramid? Because the pyramid can only stand on the broad side. You cannot stand the pyramid upside down. <laughs> it will crumble, <laughs> which means one cannot start talking about IPM and start with insecticides. That's standing the pyramid upside down. If you want to talk about IPM, you, you start talking, we start from the bottom. <laughs> we start from post plant resistance, we start from biological control, cultural control. Uh, landscape uh, education and, 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 and then we go up as needed. Um, I mentioned here uh, uh, our website uh, for our at FAO, and, and there's plenty of resources there, uh, the, the guidelines uh, for, for IPM as well as for uh, prevention and preparedness. So feel free to visit it, and um, I'll also type this in the chat box. Let's go very, very quickly through, through the pyramid, uh, if you will. So the bottom of the pyramid to me is uh, resistant or tolerant varieties. Simit already did the, 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 the lag work uh, in screening 6,000 uh, uh, germplasm uh, entries. Uh, and they, they come up with three that work pretty well. Uh, this is a, a result from a no choice trial. So you see that the checks there uh, the yield is, is pretty low because all of this actually got infested by Falarm worm, uh, while up there it looks pretty good. So these lines are available. 
uh, they're ready for, for releases through national trials. If you're interested, send me an email. I will connect you to our uh, partner at CIMIT and, and then the conversation can happen there. Um, good agronomic practice and conservation biology control. You see a lot of, a lot of different interventions there. Uh, the effectiveness vary, uh, the scalability uh, also vary. Uh, but what I would like to, to highlight here is, for example, things like field margins uh, for, for conservation biology control. So having flowering plants on the margin of your field, the effectiveness is high uh, and the strength of the scientific evidence is also. Dr. Uh, we only have five to... minutes left, please. How, how much time do I have, Sarah? Five. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Biological control is a key uh, in this, both in terms of uh, arthropod biological control as well as biopesticides. First, arthropod biological control, our partners in, in, uh, in ACP has been doing a lot of work, uh, uh, as well as, of course, ICRISAT and, and, and CABI, a lot of work in, in um, uh, taking, the, taking stock of what natural enemies are, uh, uh, occurring uh, in, in Africa, for example, as you can see here. Uh, and as I understand it, there are quite a number of, of, of species, both egg and larval parasitoids uh, that are showing promise. And in some field trials uh, that are done uh, by, by ECP, uh, they seem to have a really good, really good results uh, in suppressing the uh, uh, Relations of, of, of armor. Biopesticide is another, another avenue, of course, uh, and this is again uh, from ECP. So, for example, Bavaria Bassiana, Natalisium assembly, we know that these two, uh, you know, there are strains of this uh, fungi that, that work quite well against uh, armyworm. In terms of yield, uh, they, they, they show uh, positive results compared, compared to control or even other uh, cultural control methods, for example. And, and this is what I like eh? when, when we can start thinking about, well, you know, if the control is probably not 100% if you use one uh, uh, tactic, but that's exactly why we, we are talking about integrated pest management. It is possible to mix and match the, uh, the tactics. So when we integrate uh, push-pull, which is what you see here and what Lucian also showed, it's, it's a method, of course, I think a lot of us here already understand what this is, uh, where we modify the cropping system so that some of the uh, intercrops actually repel the pests and some of the uh, plants on the, on, the, uh, on the periphery of the field uh, uh, pull the plants, uh, the, the, the pests in. When we integrate it, that when they, uh, when they integrate that with, with uh, the use of metarisium, for example, they get further, further reduction of, of uh, bone infestation. Uh, I would be amiss, for example, if I don't mention other uh, examples of biopesticides, uh, there's a, a NPV, uh, endopathogenic virus based uh, uh, biopesticide that is uh, showing, showing really, really good results as well and starting to be registered also in countries. I understand that there are also pheromone-based mating disruption uh, uh, products that are also starting to show really good results. What are the challenges? So from our perspective, this, these are the main challenges. The registration uh, is, is still a challenge in many, many countries. Availability and accessibility and local levels. Uh, capacities for local producers, which, which may, this, this number two and number three may be connected and then farmers own capacity for the proper use of, of pesticides. So we take note that this seemed to be the challenge for, for uh, scaling up. I will go into pesticides. So if you look at our guidelines in the link that I sent you, you will see uh, a table like this, where uh, one of our PC members uh, categorize different pesticides based on their efficacy and also environmental and human health risk. And in the end, what you want are, are all that are here, right? Because these are uh, the, the pesticides, chemical and biopesticide uh, that are showing good control while having lower uh, uh, health and environmental risk. 
Here are the accuracy of, I think, for, for, for IBM. First one is economic ratio. If you look at the pyramid, the middle of the pyramid is scouting and threshold. And threshold is highly, highly dependent on what variety of maize you plant and as well as the environment. And as such, it needs to be calculated at local level, but we rarely see them calculated at local level. That's the accurate seal. The other one is, is of course, insecticide resistance management. As mentioned here, we already see some uh, gen genetic mutation or even uh, uh, diagnosis showing their resistance against parathroids and some organophosphates are, are found in, in the following uh, populations. This is my last slide, Sarah. <laughs> so so, so uh, given all of those, what is next in, in the global action? We are now busy um, organizing with all of the demonstration countries as well as our committee to have globally standardized protocols for te technology evaluation. It'll have a common database and analysis. So think about it. You'll, you'll, you'll test similar uh, options in all eight demonstration countries that I came to us. We'll be able to see what works when. And then, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, bottlenecks, we will then work uh, on capacity development of farmers and hopefully also local producers and, and try to, to also tinker a bit with, uh, with the policy and regulation enabling environment uh, to see whether we can help scale up uh, the solutions that we know. Work. Thank you so much for the time given me. Sorry if I go over time a little bit. I'm happy to get questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hadi Bouyong, uh, for uh, this very interesting uh, presentation and congratulations for uh, the valuable uh, work on uh, fall armyworm. Uh, now, uh, I'm pleased to give uh, the floor to Mr. Elijah. Uh, Mr. Elijah, please, the floor is yours. Good. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are joining us from in this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Elijah. I work as an agronomist for Flamingo Horticulture International. And welcome to today's webinar where I'm going, where we're going to share and discuss about practical IPM in commercial horticulture. Elijah, first, please, can you maximize your uh, screen, please? Is it okay now? Uh, down, uh, yeah, right side. Can you put it full screen? Yes, it is. Yeah, just the button, uh, left side, close to the uh, minus uh, button. Yes. If it's if it's possible. It is uh, it's full. Okay. Right. So, who is flamingo hot? Is it okay? No, but uh, no. Uh, Elijah, if you can just yes. choose the slideshow. Yes. 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 Sorry, I cannot help on the IT issue, but uh, if uh, Javier here uh, can give advice. Okay. Elijah, if you go to display settings, up on the on the top. Uh, yeah, it's, it's you, Sarah. No, it's not uh, me who is sharing my screen. No, uh, Elijah. Yeah. Elijah, if you go to display settings on the top of your screen. Yes, that's what I've done. Uh, no, there's, there's a, an option there, say display settings next to the show taskbar. I'm seeing it, it's left side, Elijah, yeah. Oh. 
Okay. Perfect. Okay, perfect. We can go. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry for that technical hitch. Uh, so we're going to share about practical IPM in commercial hot culture. And this is based on experience from Flamingo hot culture. Uh, first things first. Who is Flamingo Horticulture? Yeah, Elia, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. All right, next one. Okay. Sorry, I need to show my screen because you cannot. Okay, Elijah, please, uh, you can uh, share your screen. Uh, Javier, you can uh, stop sharing your screen and uh, sorry for uh, this. Okay, perfect. All right, is it okay yes, now? Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay. So Flamingo Horticulture operates, is an horticultural company in Kenya has got an operational base in Kenya, growing flowers and vegetables with destinations in the EU. Our operational base is in two sites in Kenya, Naivasha and Mount Kenya region. And in Ivasha, we work in an altitude of 1,900 meters above sea level, where we've got 220 hectares vegetables and 160 hectares flowers. The second site is an high altitude area in Timau, which is Mount Kenya region, where we have 300 hectares under vegetables and 160 hectares under flowers all supporting 6,000 employees. And we ex grow and export over 400 meters, million stems of flowers to Europe and 26 million kilograms of vegetables to Europe. And to give an impression of those areas, that is what our flower greenhouses look like. All the flower production takes place in plastic greenhouses. And that is an impression of what our vegetable field looks like. Our products have us flowers and under flowers we have roses, carnations, chips of filler, and chrysanthemums. For vegetables, we have broccoli, fine beans, snow peas, baby corn, and garden peas. We also have herbs, coriander, rosemary, and spring onions, and a bit of salad, salads like pak choi and sweet bites. And of course, when you're doing cultural production, we do face uh, uh, various pests and diseases. For flowers, common pests include mites, thrips, leaf miners, white flies. Diseases include boundary mildew, especially on the roses, downy mildew, leaf spots, botrytis. Vegetables, commonly aphids, diamond back moth on broccoli, fall annuum on baby corn downy mildews, leaf spots, ascochyta blight on the snow peas, and physiological disorders. 
and we are alive to the fact that when you are doing production for the global market, we've got various base codes that we must subscribe to and we must meet all those standards. And what are the challenges of producing crops in the tropical environment, be it flowers or vegetables? The tropical climate is favorable for the production of various pests. Their life cycles are very short. Global warming, we're seeing emergence of new pests like the white fly. The consumer is highly informed. You cannot take anything, so you must meet their standards. Various base codes, which we must meet their standards as well. MRL issues, limited product choices because of various conventions like the Stockholm Convention, Rotterdam Convention, PAN 12, the Dirty Dozen, WHO Class 1A and 1B, the Environmental Protection Agency, and we know a few molecules have not had approvals if you export to the EU. And therefore, as the first presenter, Luciano, indicated, and the second presenter, we do have alternatives in integrated pest management. However, for IPM to be successful, training and training is very, very key. You need staff who are conversant with the practice, people who know the life cycles of the various pests and diseases and the weak points when they can be attacked. In biological control, patience is very important because unlike pesticides, when you apply a biological control agent, you need to give the agent time to establish and give you control. It does not, is not rapid knockdown effect. Number three is availability and distribution of the IPM tools. Quality is very important because you can have an IPM tool, but if the quality is not up to spec, it will not be able to give you the requisite results. We require government support in the registration and regulation of the IPM tools and also industry support to encourage reduction in pesticides as we adopt IPM control solutions. And as a company which has been practicing IPM for over 20 years, what are some of the challenges of introducing IPM to commercial horticulture? As already mentioned, training of staff to understand the life cycle of the various pests and diseases and knowing the weak points when to introduce them, training to know compatibility, which product is compatible with which IPM agent. At times the IPM tools are available, but the cold chain is very, very important because if you don't observe the cold chain, you'll end up destroying the quality of the product and therefore you don't have the results that you desire. Quality is very critical. The initial cost is high, but in the long run, it comes down once the IPM agents have been established. Patience for the IPM solutions to establish. Understanding by the government inspectors, because I remember initially in the 1990s, early 2000s, when we introduced phytocillus in the management of red spider mites and roses, the inspectors, when they found live phytocillus persimilis, they thought it was a pest and therefore the products were rejected. So we need the government inspectors, government um, also to be informed in IPM. Linking scouting to application. You don't apply a biological control agent if there's no, for example, for the, uh, for the predators and the parasitoids, if there is no uh, pest in the field because they rely on those pests as their food. You need to run trials in the fields to prove the efficacy of those IPM solutions. Have a good liaison between the government regulatory framework and the production of those IPM tools. You will also need a full IPM package. For example, if you look at roses, roses suffer from 
a myriad of pests and diseases. If you have, for example, an IPM solution for spider mites, for Etocillus persimilis, and you don't have a solution for thrips, you don't have a solution for aphids, it means you'll be forced to spray. And sometimes the, those sprays will have a negative effect on phytocellus. So you need a full package to provide an IPM solution for the crop. We also need worker safety and a clean environment. And at the end of the day, when you look at the cost benefit analysis, it pays to go the IPM route. What are some of the advantages of embracing IPM in commercial horticulture? It gives you market access, especially if the products are fair trade, you'll end up getting niche markets with premium prices. Biodiversity in the environment is preserved. Worker safety is enhanced. You have a safe working environment. The consumer is assured of the product. No PHIs when you use IPM tools, no re-entry intervals, no challenges with MRLs, and no bad press that you are using pesticides when you use IPM tools to control the various pests and diseases. And for us, what are some of the results of raising IPM? We were the first company to face out MBR, methylbromide in 1996, because we got alternative soil acting trichoderma for fusarium and the dumping of fungi. We faced out most, most all the WHO class 1A and 1B. We don't use as a company. And now we are in the process of reducing the usage of WHO class 2 as we increase on the usage of IPM solutions. And when you look at those graphs, the purple line graph shows usage and the bar graphs, the red ones, we stopped using class number one in the year 2005. And you can see WHO class number two, which is yellow, we've continued, continued to reduce usage as the volume of IPM solutions goes up. And when you look at 2016, the, the line graph for IPM solutions went down because of efficiencies in application. Elijah, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, five minutes left, please. Thank you. Uh, when you look at the slide before us, that means instead of using heavy gear to do conventional spraying, you can adopt IPM, which is worker friendly. And as I said, for every country, every organization to work around the clock to ensure that for every known pest or disease, we have an IPM solution. That way, we'll reduce the number of pesticides, quantity and frequency going on. In Kenya, for example, we've got over six IPM service providers. We've got Durutec. We've got Biopest, we've got Copat, we've got Elephant Fat, Kenya Biologics, all partnering with Nature to provide solutions in our production process. And of course, as much as we talk about IPM, now the message is, is it only IPM? We are moving towards integrated crop management, looking for varieties, with resistance to various pests and diseases, contour farming to manage erosion and minimize pollution and spreading of nematodes, crop nutrition, a healthy crop will manage any, most of the attacks or will not suffer so much from pest attack, crop rotation, a clean environment, planning, how do your greenhouses face? Do they move from north-south or from east-west for maximum uh, light interception? Soil health, we're looking at sustainability to ensure that there is life beyond tomorrow. Variety selection, going for those resilient varieties, which may not give you a very high yield, but are tolerant to most of the pests and diseases. 
regular scouting to ensure that you pick these problems before they establish in your greenhouses to ensure that we've got a sustainable income. And with those, my appreciate, I will bring the presentation to an end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Elijah, for uh, the outstanding presentation. Uh, it was very interesting uh, to hear about uh, your work. Uh, now I would like uh, to move on uh, the Q&A part of the session. I'm seeing that uh, some of the panelists had already applied to uh, some questions. Uh, we have a question uh, to you, Elijah, if you, you yes. don't mind. Would the efficiency of biopesticides uh, vary between indoors and outdoors? Example, greenhouses versus, versus field. Yes, that's very correct. Uh, the, the performance of the IPM solutions work much better in an enclosed environment because the environment is controlled compared to the outdoors. Thank you. Uh, I see a question from Arturo Correra. In the case of the biopesticides used for worm control, uh, Lepidoptero, were uh, the strains used specific to the countries or were they produced in, another, uh, in other places? I can, I can handle that question, Sarah. Please. So the, the, the data showed uh, uh, the, the strains happened to be, uh, I believe, uh, collected in Kenya and it was also tested in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it can be it can be variable, of course. Uh, some of the uh, commercial uh, biopesticides that are available out there have strains that come from countries other than where it's tested or where it's being um, sold. Uh, I think Sachi also had a, a comment there that, uh, you know, an NPV uh, 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 based, uh, an entomopagenic virus based uh, by pesticide needs to be a part of, of the uh, IPM toolbox. And I, I totally agree. And in that case, of course, the, the strain may come from other, from other countries, but it's tested across all of the regions in which it will be commercialized. Thank you, Dr. Bouillonk. Uh, I'm seeing uh, a question uh, from Sashi uh, Gurumayam. I think IPM for fall armyworm should include fauligen, which has no residue, no toxicity, and is classified organic. So, uh, Hadi, again, uh, if uh, you would well, like that's, to... That's exactly what I, what I mentioned in, in my previous uh, answer. Uh, so, so I agree that uh, NPV, uh, based uh, biopesticides, so endocrine virus uh, based pesticides should be a part of, of the IPM toolbox. Thank you. Uh, so, for the time being, I'm uh, not uh, seeing uh, other questions. Uh, Sashi, uh, no. Uh, Jeanette Winsou is asking, what do you think about uh, the API? Uh, IPM concept. So I, I, I assume this is uh, integrated pen, plant pass and uh, integrated pass and pollinator management. Uh, maybe, maybe it's good to, to give to give the floor also for uh, Luciano. To, uh, to respond Luciano, to please. We have a question uh, from uh, Jeanette Winsou. What do you think about the IPPM concept? Well, now I sometimes get a bit confused with all these acronyms, but I think IPPM, the IPPM, I I know, uh, means integrated production and pest management. I hope it is the one that uh, that she means. Uh, so what I think of that concept, uh, if it is the integrated production and pest management. I think it is closely linked to the farmer field school uh, 
idea. So it is um, training uh, or better raising awareness of farmers on pesticide risk through practical field experiments. Uh, and I think it's very good for, for the simple reason that uh, it's not the same training or teaching something to young people uh, or to uh, farmers or anyway adult people. So the, the method must be different and the idea behind this kind of, uh, of concepts is to train people through practical experience. And uh, I think it's the, it's the most effective way to do it as it has been uh, demonstrated uh, in the many years that uh, FAO have conducted their uh, farmer field schools. It is, uh, farmers are the same everywhere at all latitudes you can see the same reactions from farmers, at least that's my experience. Uh, farmers are not interested in nice PowerPoint presentations. They are not interested in, in, in nice pictures. They want to see things in practice. They want to see uh, results in the field. And th as far as I know, that's the spirit behind uh, farmer field schools and also uh, this IPPM program developed by FAO. Yeah, and uh, I'm seeing uh, Jeanette through the chat is uh, clarifying uh, her question and uh, she's uh, mentioning that she means integrated pest and pollinator management uh, ah, okay, by so, uh, her abbreviation. Ah, okay, so well, I must say I'm not so familiar with, with that one. I can, I can uh, take a step at that. Please. Yes. If you give me the floor, all right. Thank you. So, thank you, Janet, for for the for the question. I think I think IPPM is 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 a very interesting angle. Uh, in my opinion, uh, a lot of what we do and practice in IPM is is uh, uh, supposed to be automatically sort of make pest management programs more uh, friendly uh, towards pollinator. Uh, especially as, if, as I say, you know, the pyramid. You have to start from from the broad base, right? You can't start from the from the from the tip. Um, then you know the, the the reduction of 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 the load of pesticide there hopefully already make the uh, agroecosystem more friendly towards pollinators. Uh, in the fall armyworm IPM, uh, for example, if you remember, I show you the, the table. Uh, essentially, classifying different pesticides and biopesticides on their efficiency, but also on their environmental and human health risks. When we say we are classifying these active ingredients against environmental risks, what we take a look at is the risk against pollinator, uh, as well as the risk against, for example, fish uh, and, and other organisms. Uh, so you you can you can see in that table, and if you look at the link that I put in the chat, you can download the guidelines there. Um, all of the active ingredients that do not fall under the um, under the rubric of having a high environmental risk, hopefully they 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 come from the database that shows they have a low risks against pollinator. So this is one one particular way in which we can we can already see in one table. Uh, uh, options that integrate both pest management and pollinator uh, conservation concerns. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, another question uh, related to fall armyworm. Is there any parasite weed or predator commercially used uh, against uh, this pest? So please, uh, if you can uh, respond. Sure, thank you. This, this is an interesting, this is an interesting question. As Elijah is smiling. Huh? <laughs> Elijah, there was, uh, what is the scope out there for, for uh, mass releases of, of natural enemies against a field crop uh, that, that, is, that is in an open field? <laughs> what's, what's your thought, Elijah? For an open field, you lose everything unless you, you know, unless you've got acres and acres of the same crop, if it's limited, when you release a parasitoid, it just disappear to the natural environment. So, 
you need an enclosed environment. <laughs> and 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 that is is the Achilles heel of of the of the business model of trying to to you know to to sell this mass releases of natural enemies in an open <laughs> open agro ecosystem uh, <laughs> such as maize. The, yeah. the the particular strategy that are now being tried, for example, by by ECP, um, yeah. is uh, doing a, a, a mass production. Of, of the different parasitoids, uh, and then releasing them, uh, being paid for, I think, by by farmer groups. So, so the farmer groups put, put together some funds uh, to offset the, the production, uh, and and in that way they, they they can release it in in a larger acreage, not not, not a single field acreage. Uh, it's it's an experimental business model. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but but I think it, it sort of already tackles uh, a particular weakness, perhaps, of, of trying to sell natural enemies, anthropo natural enemies at field. At field. Thank you, Hadi. Elijah, I have uh, two questions uh, for you. So, had you shared your uh, experience with uh, other uh, countries and uh, Blessing Mulima is uh, asking, uh, how uh, could you convince farmers to start using IPM? So please, if you can respond to uh, these two questions together. Yes, I know change is always resistant, especially, uh, you know, I remember in the 1990s when we were facing the imminent loss of methipromide as a soil fumigant, we said, how are we going to grow flowers, especially carnations, which have a lot from fusarium? How can we grow without soil sterilization? So the, our suggestion here is set up a demonstration farm and show that IPM can work. The demonstration farm will be 100% IPM and conventional side by side, and then have a field day where you invite fellow farmers to come and learn the practice of using IPM. And what was the other question? How you can convince uh, farmers to, uh, to uh, adopt uh, IPPM in, uh, in general? And uh, had you had the experience to uh, work on the promotion of IPPM and share your uh, experience with the other uh, neighbor countries with, uh, yeah, please. Yes, like in Kenya, all, all the rose growers are encouraged to be 100% IPM. And one of the challenges is, yes, the farmers are willing to go 100% IPM. The service providers are not enough. The demand is outstripping supply. So we need to feel the requirement first of one country before you go to the next country. Thank you, uh, Elijah. Uh, uh, Sarah, if I can add yes, yeah. something yes. to what Elijah just said, uh, I, from what I know uh, about flamingo uh, operations, they, they are always convincing farmers, uh, fl flamingo horticulture have quite a few outgrowers. So they always have to show to the farmers that what they are proposing is working because that, that's the only point that is of interest for the farmers. So yeah. practical demonstration that what you are proposing is something effective is the only way to persuade the farmers, which is basically what I, what I said before. And the other very important element is provide technical assistance to those farmers because Correct. as we said it's a long process and you cannot simply uh, give an initial session to the farmer and then you are on your own you need to take the farmer by hand and go through uh, through every step with him maybe for one year two years but be there whenever the farmer needs your help your assistance 
Thank you, Elijah. I have another question uh, to you, please. IPA methods are most of the time used for a very limited or reduced areas. Uh, uh, sorry, this question is uh, addressed to Luciano. IPA methods are most of the time used for limited or reduced areas. Can be done for uh, very large areas. Uh, well, I I replied in writing to to that one, but. Uh, uh, obviously, if you have a large area, it may be more complicated than if you work on a small farm, but IPM can be applied on any, uh, on any farm, independent of the size. And I think what Elijah just showed us is the, is the demonstration of that, uh, because they are, Flamingo have something like 400 hectares of flowers and six or seven hundred hectares of vegetables. So that's really a big, big operation. What is very important is, uh, and Elijah can confirm this, is to give proper training to, to their technicians, to their farmers, uh, because everybody must have a very deep knowledge of what they uh, should employ uh, in their IPM program. Thank you, Luciano. Another uh, question. Uh, can we meet IPM and the agroecology? Of they have to coexist to re-up maximum benefits. So, Luciano, you want uh, to take this question, please? Uh... Well, I, I don't consider myself an agroecology expert, but yeah, I, I think many of the objectives are uh, IPM has are in common with agroecology. So it's, the, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's just making use of uh, uh, what was the term people use these days, uh, uh, agroecological services. So uh, at my times, we were talking about uh, beneficial organisms or beneficial insects. And th these days, people talk about agroecological services. Uh, I, I would say, yes, that there is certainly a lot of scope in integrating different techniques for two uh, to disciplines that have common objectives. Thank you. Uh, another uh, question. Uh, so IPM is uh, usually applied to control insects attacks. Is there any IPM to control rodents and birds? Yes, IPM can be used to control any pest or any weed including weed, including fungi. Uh, it's just a matter of choosing the right, uh, the right tools. So if we talk about rodents, again, it can be traps, it can be uh, some predators, uh, some parasites, the, a well-known product that was developed already many years ago to control rodents was a biological product uh, which was based uh, on an, on a bacteria, uh, which was did, was not successful commercially in the Western world because it was very closely related uh, to a human pathogen. So it never got registration in Europe or in the US, but it was developed, for example, in Eastern Europe and uh, uh, what was then the Soviet Union. So it, it is possible to apply the IPM concepts to any type of pest. Thank you, Luciano. Uh, now, I uh, think that uh, we, uh, our panelists had replied uh, to all uh, the questions uh, on uh, the QA uh, box uh, verbally and uh, by uh, written. Uh, and I am a pleasure uh, now to give the floor uh, to my colleague uh, Mario for uh, the closing remarks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and thank you especially because uh, you did an excellent work facilitating this session. Uh, I think you made sure that we 
we kept everyone uh, on track with, with time. So that's, that's very good. Um, and thank you, of course, to, to the experts that have shared uh, their experience and knowledge through excellent presentations that were very clear. And of course, because the answers that uh, they gave to the questions that were submitted by many of the participants, I think, uh, clarified uh, all those issues that were raised uh, uh, through those questions. I think we had the opportunity to learn a lot about uh, IPM from the very basic concepts that were addressed by Luciano and then talking about the different techniques and also with his experience giving his opinion on when and where and how some of those techniques might be or not the most uh, uh, appropriate ones. Uh, so that was really good to hear from, from someone with uh, his experience. And of course, the, the presentation from, from Bu Yung and, and, and sharing with us uh, the work that FAO and other uh, partners are doing uh, towards the global action uh, for full army war. And we're looking forward also to hear about the next steps in that particular uh, uh, work. And of course, the presentation from Elijah, which was very clear you know, about the company that is really implementing IPM solutions through after so many years with, with uh, a huge success. And you know, he gave us clear examples on how that works. Uh, of course, talking about the challenges, uh, he was very clear about some of those aspects that really need to be addressed constantly. And one of them is training, capacity building, and of course, having the support from regulators and also from the private sector. So it was very nice to hear all of this experience uh, within the same subject. Um, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues from the Secretariat who uh, helped to make this event possible. Uh, Sarah, Alessandra, Javier, Linda, uh, and everyone else who, who supported uh, in the organization of this event. Um, also the questions that uh, were submitted by many of you give us a very clear indication that there is a high interest in this topic and uh, that will give us the possibility of uh, planning organizing uh, future webinars uh, on, on IPM, possibly touching on other very specific aspects that were raised uh, during the discussion. And uh, I would like to have the opportunity to invite you to join you to join us uh, in future events. I share with you on the chat box, uh, the link on the Rotterdam Convention website where you can find the webinars library. You can see the information from past events and also upcoming uh, events. Uh, some of them are focused specifically on alternatives. Already on December 3rd, next week, we have a webinar on strategies to reduce the use, to, to reduce the use of uh, highly hazardous pesticides, HSPs. Uh, probably you already received the invitation. And if not, uh, I invite you to go into our website so you can see the link and register. And we also heard some questions that were uh, talking about the, the relevance and, and, and interest in, in, in biopesticides. So we have another webinar on specific aspect, aspects for the registration of biopesticides that is on the 13th of December, and you will see the detailed information on the program in our website. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon. Have a nice uh, day, afternoon, night. Uh, stay safe and um, looking forward to see you again. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.